Department of Public Health seminar. And uh, today it was going to be a double act, but uh, we're just uh, having die. Unfortunately, the other speaker, Alec uh, Ikaroma, had to attend a funeral. So uh, Di is going to be um, talking about uh, cancer control in small island states of the Pacific. And as you know, she's head of the uh, Department of Public Health, but she's also just taken up a new job as uh, the media call it the new boss of the cancer agency, but it's actually the interim national director of cancer control. So uh, handing over to Di for a great presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Yeah, no, the Cancer Agency doesn't actually exist yet, so it's quite hard to be the boss of it. Although maybe it's easier when it doesn't exist, I don't know. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's great to see you all here. Um, right, let's just get on with it, shall we? Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm talking today about cancer control in the Pacific, and I just, um, by way of background, um, this work came out of a series that I led um, with Lancet Oncology, which was um, focused on cancer control in small island developing states. So we were focusing on the Caribbean and the Pacific regions in particular, but two of the papers were focused solely on the Pacific. Um, and the series was launched at the um, Pacific Health Ministers meeting a couple of months ago in Tahiti. Um, and I'm really presenting on behalf on, of a large sort of pan-Pacific collaboration. Um, that's a list of authors that were named on the papers, but behind those were a whole lot of people living in the countries that we um, were included in the series who provided information to us or had conversations with us or met with us. So, um, yeah, just to acknowledge that this, um, I am standing on behalf of a, of a large group of people. And you can see up here um, in the corner there, can you see? No, it doesn't. Doesn't matter. Top right hand corner there, you can see Rachel um, Dyer, who she, she um, comes from the Solomon Islands, her family's from the Solomon Islands. She worked closely with me on this. She did a lot of the running around with the series and, and collected all the specific data from all uh, 50 something countries that we were involved with, 22 in the Pacific. Um, and those were this, uh, the printout of the spreadsheets. That's just the Pacific region spreadsheets. So we had a lot of detail on the countries and the information I'm going to be presenting today is just the high level overview. But there's a lot more information in the series themselves. Um, oh, I should also say that um, both the WHO and World Health Organization and SPC, um, which is the kind of, for those who don't know, Pan-Pacific organisation, a little bit like the UN of the Pacific. They were both uh, collaborators and partners in this work. Um, so for just a little bit of background about the Pacific region, the, the Pacific region is made up of 22 very diverse countries and territories. They vary in terms of culture and language, history, population size, geography and economic and social development. But they do share some some key characteristics, um, almost universally, not entirely though. Um, the first is fragile ecosystems, and that is exacerbated by the effects of the climate crisis that we are currently um, in the midst of. Um, the Pacific region is at the forefront of the impacts of that crisis. In fact, something like five of the top 15 um, highest risk countries in general from natural disasters are in the Pacific. The top of all of them is Vanuatu. So these countries are dealing with a lot of um, risk from the natural environment and do have fragile ecosystems. They're isolated in that they are surrounded by vast amounts of water. Um, they have limited resources um, and small population sizes almost universally. And the small po population sizes means that even if, when you're thinking about health, even if um, the population is pa paying a large proportion of their income theoretically in um, you know, in tax to go to the health system, you've still got an abs in absolute terms a small amount of money because you've just got a small population. Um, and uh, there are also vulnerable economies, which is partly a factor of these other um, drivers. So this is the Pacific region, a vast geographical um, region. Um, but I thought it's useful just to highlight some of the characteristics of um, a few of the countries in the Pacific, because in doing that, you can, you can already see what some of the barriers in terms of cancer control and, and healthcare in general are. So first of all, um, Papua New Guinea. 
So Papua New Guinea is by far the most populous country in the Pacific, 8 to 10 million people. So there's more people in Papua New Guinea than the rest of the Pacific. Actually, if you include um, New Zealand in there as well, there's still more people in Papua New Guinea. Um, it's made of, up of 600 islands, 800 separate languages, 80% of the inhabitants live in rural areas and over half the country is inaccessible by road. So right there you can see there are very substantial challenges in delivering healthcare and cancer care specifically. Um, Samoa, possibly a place that we're more familiar with um, close to us here in New Zealand. So Samoa, much smaller population, less than 200,000 people. Cyclones and other major uh, weather events are common occurrences in Samoa and across the Pacific region, as I've already mentioned. There was a tsunami that killed 189 people um, back in 2009, which I'm sure you remember. But that's just to highlight the fact that um, natural disasters are a very common occurrence in the Pacific. They have a really substantial impact on not only the people involved directly, but on the infrastructure and diverts resource and effort to deal with those major events. Um, and in Samoa, they've got extremely high prevalence rates of um, type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, amongst other um, uh, chronic conditions, which, which um, suck up a lot of resource in terms of healthcare again. Um, and then uh, Kiribati. Kiribati has an even smaller population, less than 115,000 people. And they're spread over a, an area of 3.5 million kilometres squared, um, which is a vast area. Um, they got their independence from the UK back in 1979. And um, the, predict the predictions are that Kiribati will either be uninhabitable or potentially submerged within the next 50 to 100 years. So again, that has a huge impact on the country, the people, the social um, fabric of that country, as well as their ability to um, deliver health care. And the little map there was one that we kind of put together when we were thinking about this um, the series, just looking at the distances that people had to travel just to get even quite basic healthcare. So again, if you're trying to deliver something like cancer care where you're gonna need recurrent visits and you're looking at several hours flying time, it, it's very difficult to think about how you manage that. Okay, moving on to cancer specifically. Um, these graphs show the top five cancers in terms of incidence and mortality over the Pacific region for men and women respectively. Um, these are sort of the best data we have, but the data from the Pacific are very incomplete because the surveillance systems there are, are, not, are not great. But um, these are data, they come from the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And what you can see there is a mixed picture. So you have um, cancers there, which we might loosely refer to cancers and sort of lifestyle cancers, not a term that I like, but well, cancers that are also common in New Zealand, like um, prostate cancer and breast cancer, um, which are the most common cancers for men and women respectively. And breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer death for Pacific women living in the Pacific. Um, you can see cancers are driven by tobacco, the tobacco epidemic. Um, and there's a lot of activity uh, focused on that in the Pacific at the moment. But you can also see cancers driven by uh, chronic infection. You can see cervical cancer there is the second leading cause of cancer death for Pacific women living in the Pacific. Now, cervical cancer is one of the most preventable cancers that there are. Um, we have very low rates of cervical cancer now in New Zealand and Australia and in most parts of the of, of high-income countries. Um, and this is a failure of cancer prevention in the region. Um, there's also other cancers which are driven by infections. You can see liver cancer and stomach cancer are both in the top five for men there, for example. And when we look at what the future load of cancer is going to be, this is a series of projections, again, from the International Agency for Research on Cancer. The sort of greyish line in the middle is the best guess, assuming no change in cancer incidence. And if we make that assumption, we're still looking at about a doubling of the cancer burden over the next 20 years. Um, and even if cancer incidence decreases over time, which is the bottom line, um, there's still going to be an increase in cancer burden. So this is something that uh, the region needs to grapple with. But there are really massive challenges in cancer control in the region. This um, is not in the region. This is Mount Everest, just in case you wondered which island that was. Um, 
Okay, so just running through some of the challenges facing the region. First of all, in terms of cancer planning and policy, there has been a really um, concentrated focus on NCD, so non-communicable disease planning um, in the region. The Pacific region have um, this fantastic initiative called the Pacific Monitoring Alliance for NCD Action, MANA. It's, a, it's basically a way that countries can look at how they're doing in relation to um, prevalence of risk factors for NCDs and also in terms of their, um, their action to address those risk factors. So how they're doing, for example, in terms of tobacco control interventions or alcohol interventions. And these, the, the results of that, that, this work are presented at ministers' meetings, for example, which is really excellent, because what happens is there ends up being a competition between countries. So it's a sort of a, it's a, a traffic light. So you green, you're doing well, yellow, you're not doing so great, red, you're doing badly, basically. And so, you know, you're looking at your country and you've got a whole lot of red and the country next door has got a whole lot of green. You think, right, we're going to do something about that. I suggested at the last meeting that we should put New Zealand on there because we've definitely got something to learn in some of, the, some of the areas where the Pacific are doing really well. But having said that, there are very few examples of comprehensive cancer plans in the Pacific. Um, and there is generally either incomplete or non-existent cancer surveillance systems, which makes planning for cancer control very difficult. It makes it very difficult to know what the true burden of cancer is within countries, and it makes it difficult to know what the, what the trends over time are in terms of cancer. So when we think about cancer prevention, as I mentioned, tobacco control initiatives are well developed in many countries in the Pacific, but there's a lot of work to do um, in other countries. Um, hepatitis B vaccination is, is pretty widespread in the um, Pacific region, with a few hotspots where that's not the case, Papua New Guinea being one of them. But as I talked about earlier, cervical cancer, cancer prevention is substantially underdone. Um, HPV vaccination uh, is very limited in the Pacific, and organised cervical screening is lacking in just about everywhere, other than in a few um, of the US-affiliated states and the French states, which are New Caledonia and French Polynesia. But even if you include all of those countries where it's done the best in the region, only two out of 22 countries have cervical screening coverage over 40%. So you can see why um, deaths from cervical cancer is still so common in the region. There are perhaps kind of obviously very few examples of organizing, organized screening for the more complex screening programs like breast screening. And then we get into cancer diagnosis and treatment and the challenges there. Less than a third of all Pacific nations have either a full-time pathologist or a radiologist. Most Pacific nations don't have MRI or CT scanners, and, and there are only basic laboratory services in many of the islands. So that, of course, makes timely cancer diagnosis really difficult. Often specimens have to be um, sent offshore, which is both expensive and time-consuming, and, and often the results go astray. Um, people will be waiting sometimes months for results or they don't come back, and it does result in very substantial delays in many cases, which can take people from a curable um, state to an, a, a more advanced stage of disease. <clears throat> and then there's the problems with um, treatment. So not surprisingly, specialised cancer surgery is available only in a few countries. And, and that's not surprising given the size of the population. You can't expect highly specialised cancer services or, or surgical services in a population where you've got 200,000 people. But, but also over the entire region outside of Guam, which was one of the US states and the French territories, there is one single medical, medical oncologist who lives in Fiji. There are none in Papua New Guinea with their population of eight to 10 million people. There are no radiation oncologists anywhere. There is no radiotherapy available and palliative care is poorly developed. And in particular, there's poor access to morphine. So morphine is really, really hard to come by. There are often stockouts. Um, there's a lot of fear and concern about using morphine. Um, often district nurses won't use it because of fear of um, addiction, even when people are in a very terminal state, or fear that people will stop breathing and things like that. There's a lot of um, uh, fear of the use of, of opioids, which is quite common um, around the world, particularly in low and middle income countries. But it means that not only do people um, have advanced disease at diagnosis and end up um, dying from cancer, but they die without pain relief, which is, should not be happening for such a low-cost intervention as morphine. Um, the use and support of traditional healers is widespread throughout the Pacific region. So that all paints a pretty 
depressing picture, but it's not all doom and gloom. Now, if Alec was here, he would be taking over at this point. I was going to do the kind of the doom and gloom and he was going to do the upside, but I get to do both now, which is, which is nice. So um, we, we wrote two papers about the Pacific. The first paper was just scoping out the situation in the Pacific, which had never been done before, pulling together the information, which was very difficult to pull together actually, and, and finding out where the issues were. The second paper was explicitly to look at where there were um, areas of innovative or good practice that might be useful to share between countries within the Pacific and other small island developing states around the world, and in fact, beyond and other countries around the world. And here are four of the, um, the initiatives that we highlighted. So the first one was this regionalization coalition building that occurred in the US affiliated states. They pulled together the countries there to form the North Pacific Cancer Control Program and partners, and also a second entity called the Cancer Council of Pacific Islands. And they um, included representatives from each of the countries. They pooled their sort of expertise and resource to develop a regional comprehensive cancer plan with individual country plans which sat under that. Um, they developed a regional cancer registry where, again, uh, the, obviously the data were collected within country, but they were pulled together so that you only needed one centre to do the analysis and the data checking and that sort of stuff. And they also used that, that um, structure to leverage funds um, to support their work. Um, and in the case of those states, it was from the US, and they, they did that very effectively. So that as a result of that initiative, there was some really good effective cancer control planning, um, efficient use of resources in terms of expertise to develop the kind of plans that they, were, that they needed and also look, look at how they could um, uh, implement screening, for example. Um, they coordinated and shared expertise. They effectively leveraged resources and they did develop a range of strate strategies and policies which resulted in action. Um, of course, it's not very easy to uh, maintain such a, a coordinated approach over multiple countries over a length of time. And I think it's probably fair to say that some of the activities have started to wane in that area. So it sort of needs to be revitalized, but it's still a, it was actually the, the only example of multiple countries working together in this way in cancer control um, in the world. So it was a really excellent example of that. The second example um, specifically focused on cervical cancer prevention and PNG. So just this map here, the little, the tip of the country down here at the bottom left of the map is a, the tip of Australia, northern tip of Australia, and then you've got Papua New Guinea there. You can see they're very close to each other. If you happen to be a woman born in the tip of Australia there, um, you've got a 60th of the chance of dying from um, cervical cancer than if you happen to be born in Papua New Guinea. It, Papua New Guinea has the second highest rate of cervical cancer in the world. It's got rates right up there with the, some of the rates you see in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they have tried a variety of approaches to manage the problem of cervical cancer in Papua New Guinea. They tried to implement a cytological screening program, which is the kind of screening program we have at the moment with taking of smears and sending them off to laboratories and calling women back if there was abnormalities. But that was almost impossible to implement in the environment, that is, the challenges in that particular environment. They also tried to do um, VIA, which is visual inspection with acetic acid, which is where um, the cervix is visualized, acetic acid is put on the cervix, and if there's a lesion there, it's, it's dealt with there, it's, thermo, it's cryothermied off right then and there. So the, the woman is treated at the spot on the spot. But that was also, that also failed to work. It was unacceptable to the women. And they just were, found it really difficult to, to involve women in that, in that screening program.
So the, uh, there we go. so the outcomes for that, they've now got a second bigger study underway to look at the cost effectiveness and the health service implement, implementation requirements and the acceptability and all of those sorts of things. But the, but the results are really promising. So this is, a, this is an approach that's likely to be able to be used both in PNG and around the Pacific, as well as, as in other um, low middle income countries. And in fact, you know, we haven't got up to having a um, self-sampling HPV kind of program here yet. So, you know, they're, they're actually ahead of um, many high income countries as well. Um, the outcomes for children with cancer in the Pacific were really poor. So what was happening in these countries highlighted in that map there, the, the countries that are more closely aligned to New Zealand, is that, country, uh, that, that children with cancer were referred to, um, to New Zealand, but they were tending to um, be referred late um, and so their outcomes were bad. And even when they were treated, they were, when they were, after they were sent back to their countries, they were often dying of infection. So overall, their outcomes were very poor. Um, and so a group of um, pediatric oncologists in New Zealand, along with um, some health professionals from those islands, got together to do some work to improve outcomes for cancer in the region, for children's cancer in the, in the region. Um, and so they did, they developed triage criteria. So it was very clear which children needed to come to New Zealand and which children could potentially be treated on island and make sure that the children that needed to come to New Zealand, that happened quickly. Um, they developed context specific treatment protocols. So they de developed protocols for treating um, children's cancer that could be delivered on island. So they weren't exactly the same protocols that we might have in New Zealand, but they were effective protocols that took account of the resources that were available on island. Um, they developed a, a Pacific Children's Cancer Registry. Um, they developed supportive care guidelines, which was really critical to make sure that neutropenic children, children that were um, susceptible to infection, didn't get infection either on returning from New Zealand or after they'd had treatment on the island. Um, and they also developed some twinning arrangements, so um, weekly video conferencing between the island doctors and nurses and those um, working on, in New Zealand in specialist centres, for example. And, and this set of um, initiatives has resulted in a substantial improvement in the outcomes for children in those countries. And then surgical services. So health workforce in general is a problem in the region. And if you go back to the sort of early mid 90s, um, there were very few uh, resident Pacific surgeons, again, outside the US states and the French states. Um, there was a lack of surgical infrastructure and there was a, there's a really major brain drain of surgeons from the Pacific region to Australia and New Zealand because doctors would leave there to get trained, they would leave to come to Australia and New Zealand to get trained and then they wouldn't go back. Um, there was little postgraduate surgical training available in the Pacific, there was a little bit in Papua New Guinea and that was about it. So a program was set up as a partnership between the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons and a number of Pacific countries. And they supported the development of postgraduate surgical training within the Pacific, as well as supporting surgical services. So sending teams out to countries, which were designed to not only provide the surgical services to the population, but also to upskill the local um, healthcare system so that they could manage, you know, that it strengthened their own systems, so that they could manage more themselves. And they also provided professional, professional support to the individual surgeons. So the surgeons that were working in quite isolated circumstances and op potentially operating on a far wider range of um, cases that they would, than they would be doing in Australia or New Zealand had professional support from their colleagues. And this has been very successful. Um, there's now postgraduate surgical training in Fiji as well as in PNG. There's been a very substantial increase in the number of surgeons across the Pacific. And those surgeons are much more likely to have been trained by Pacific surgeons, um, which has of course lessened the brain drain. Uh, there's also been some really good partnerships that have built up. So there's surgical teams that go into the Pacific to help and assist. And the relationship between the Royal College of Surgeons here and, and across the Pacific has also strengthened. Having said that, there's still a really substantial shortage in the number of surgeons in the Pacific, as well as other um, healthcare professional groups. So as I mentioned earlier on, um, we presented this work to the ministers meeting, the, the Pan-Pacific ministers meeting, um, a couple of months ago, and they received this work with a you know, reasonable amount of enthusiasm. They're keen to progress it. We, presented them with six specific recommendations or high priority recommendations. So the first was that we um, recommended a regional approach to this. It's hard to manage cancer on a country by country basis. 
um, we suggested that ca cancer control needed to be integral to their broader NCD planning, that they needed to strengthen palliative care with a particular focus on access to oral morphine. Um, they needed to strengthen their um, focus on preventing cervical cancer. And we have a meeting coming up at the beginning of December involving an, um, a number of Pacific countries as well as, well as WHO and IARC and SPC to look at what the region can do in relation to strengthening that activity. Improving cancer surveillance so we know what the burden is and we know where we're going. And we're working with IARC who is about to launch a cancer registry hub, a Pacific focused cancer registry hub to support the region to improve that activity. And also developing cancer treatment capacity, which will look very different to the type of cancer treatment that we would have here in New Zealand, um, but focusing particularly on the highly treatable cancers. So where it's a particular tragedy is where you have somebody who's got a highly treatable cancer, um, which cannot be treated and isn't referred until too late. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that there are mechanisms in place to ensure that there is um, programs to, to ensure that we, there is better treatment for those sorts of people. Um, so I think I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Di, for a very comprehensive and rich talk. So uh, opening it up for questions now and uh, please wait till the uh, microphone gets to you so that the people online can hear your uh, questions. Okay, I might just start with one myself. So uh, <laughs> given uh, now that HPV vaccine is so cheap, uh, way under a dollar a dose, uh, I mean, it does seem a bit, of, a bit of a problem that so few countries have advanced that. And it may be at this stage, it would even be cost effective to give to boys as well. Yeah you're in the lower coverage zone. Yeah, so there's a lot of activity around this. So I think we're going to see quite a lot of action quite quickly now for, for the reasons that you give. Um, and a number of countries have started looking at um, rolling this out. I think it's UNICEF is um, actually leading the charge in terms of getting good, um, you know, good price for the region. And, um, and so I, I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful that that will change quite quickly. And it's, it's a clear priority for the region. It's, as you say, extremely cost effective and, yep. Jodie. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I'm from the Caribbean, so I'm actually very interested in, um, so you guys did a lot of interventions in the Pacific and uh, I've noticed some things that also happen in the Caribbean, such as the brain drain. And I was wondering what the um, differences between the two regions are, but also the similarities. Yeah, well, the similarities are, of course, that they've both got lots of small islands. <laughs> and there are a lot of the similar, you know, in terms of um, fragile ecosystems and dealing with global warming and, and relatively limited resources. The differences are um, Caribbean has much is much wealthier although the wealth is very unevenly unevenly distributed there's a lot more public private partnership because there is a lot of private money in the caribbean so there is for example there's a lot more radiotherapy available um, but a lot of it is in the private sector um, uh, other key differences the the health system is somewhat more complex in the health systems are somewhat more complex in the Caribbean. The, the the in the Pacific region it's almost entirely publicly funded, whereas in the Caribbean there are mixed models and it varies across across the region. Um, what else? Yeah, so a, a lot of the, the problems are similar despite those differences. So cervical screening is patchy across the Caribbean. And again, um, there's work to be done to try and bring that together and try and have more of a um, coordinated approach. The Caribbean are doing better in terms of um, they have uh, some really good drug, uh, regional drug purchasing organisations that, that are bringing cancer drugs in. Um, uh, so they're doing a little bit better in that regard. In terms of um, uh, treatment, the biggest problem in the Caribbean is this huge inequity, where if you've got money, you can get treated. In the Pacific, pretty much no one can, except if you can afford to get on a plane and 
and you know, but in the Caribbean, you can get treated if you've got money. And so this dealing with that inequity is a really big issue as well. Um, the other really interesting thing, just sort of behind the scenes thing that we, we found working, was quite different working with the two regions. Um, we were able to get really good engagement from the leaders in the Pacific region. We had much, much more difficulty getting engagement um, from the leaders in the Caribbean. Um, and we're not, we couldn't quite work out whether it was because all our communications weren't getting to the right people or because they just weren't interested. Uh, we, were, we had a lot of high, we had the same sort of level of, we had pan um, regional organisations involved and very senior people involved, but we could not, like, we could not get um, a slot, for example, in their minister's meeting despite, me, I mean, requests from all sorts of high-powered people. And um, which makes it very difficult for the region to address this if you can't get it in front of the leaders. So there were some really interesting differences there as well. Thank you, Di. Um, you mentioned there were five Pacific countries that don't have cancer registries. So are you able to name those? Oh, no, there were lots of cancer. No, not five, lots of them. Basically, it'd be quicker to name the ones that do. <laughs> Um, New Caledonia has a, a pretty good functioning um, cancer registry. Fiji has one. It's not, it's not fantastic, but it's, it's, it's okay. Um, Tonga is just starting to develop one at the moment. Um, yeah, so there, there, there's, some, and there's some patchy sort of hospital-based registration and things like that, but there's not very many examples of really high, what we would consider high-quality population-based cancer registries. And how about Samoa? Samoa, No. But they're really, really, really keen to develop one. So there's, um, in Samoa, there's, uh, there's particularly um, a couple of patho a patho she's a pathologist now, I think, um, who has been doing some work to try and get cancer registry up and running. But they're one of the countries that IARC is hoping to work with to develop their cancer registration capacity. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, thank you, Diana. Shane Ahu with Cancer Society. Um, that was really, really informative and really great. Thank you. I do have wonder if the group also just had a bit of an eye on some of the um, preventative uh, public health policies and activities that are happening across the Pacific to uh, try and you know, prevent further cancers. I'm yeah. thinking some of the work around the outlawing of fizzy drinks and uh, tobacco and some of the small yeah. islands. And yeah, so there's quite a lot of, of that. Yeah, absolutely. And there's quite a lot of information on that in the paper. Um, and actually, I should hand over to Andrea, who wrote that section of the paper. She's sitting there looking relaxed. Um, but actually, some of the countries in the Pacific are doing way better than we are in that respect. There's a number of countries that have introduced um, sugar tax. Um, there's some countries that have really done very well in terms of um, uh, tobacco, you know, I don't want to say tobacco prevention policies. It's not quite right terminology, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, so there, there's a really strong focus on those sorts of initiatives. It's not across the board. There is, you know, again, there are some countries that are doing better than others, and there are some really high smoking rates in some countries. So there's, there's definitely work to do. But in terms of um, like sugar-free taxes, they're actually they're ahead of us as a, as a region. Would you agree, Andrea? Did you want to add anything? <laughs> Just on that theme, uh, was do people ever comment on New Zealand exporting tobacco to the Pacific? Yeah. And New Zealand also built a tobacco factory with aid money in Samoa as well. And I'm wondering if there's any pushback against that. Yeah, yeah, that that is you know that is discussed. In fact, if anybody went, there has been a conference at the Otago Global Health. Oh, geez, got E I can't think what the I stands for, but anyway, Institute maybe conference and Colin Tukia Tonga, who is the current director general of SPC, um, until the end of this year anyway, he, he's talking about the um, impact of um, non communicable diseases and talking about the roles that the high income countries have in terms of exporting bad stuff into the Pacific region and also the tobacco companies. You know, as to, to make, um, as smoking prevalence comes down here, like pushing out into the into the region. So yeah, that is recognised as an issue. Okay, well, if that's uh, it for questions, I'd just like everyone to join me in thanking Di for a great presentation. <laughs> <laughs>